I'm going to make a short video to explain exactly what I do in my Bible studies. Um, if you've already been watching some, um, some of my videos, you've noticed that I begin with a text and I end up with uh, something like this, uh, with an exegetical idea stating what the text is all about. And I've drawn relationships with these brackets, uh, which is essentially helping to understand what is being said here in one s simple sentence. This is called discourse analysis. Determining the exegetical idea is a result of making a relationship between the sentences of a particular text from the Bible. Okay, So, how do I do that? Essentially, you have to begin by first asking, what is the exegetical idea? The exegeti what do I mean by the exegetical idea? It is a sentence, in, or in a sentence, stating what the author is saying. So in, for example, <clears throat> long ago, uh, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets in many times and in many ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, and sustains all things by the word of his power. After having made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs." So I take a text, I subordinate the clauses based upon their relationships uh, to maybe a subject, uh, a verb, uh, some sort of prepositional phrase, and then how do they re relate to one another. And so I come up with, in these last days, God speaks, he spoke, and now he is speaking, so he's God speaks to us now through Christ, his son, because of who he is and what he's done. So that's the exegetical idea in a sentence. How do I do this? That's what I want to talk about uh, briefly. And why do I do that, uh, essentially? So let me, actually, why do we determine the exegetical idea. Why do we determine the exegetical idea? Because of hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is essentially applying the Bible. Today there's a lot of craziness going on out there uh, pertaining to um, preaching and uh, teaching and with the internet you get all sorts of craziness um, and misuse uh, and application of the Bible. So historically, exegesis has been consistently taking or defining, determining what is the exegetical idea, and then applying it to today. So that's how you take the Bible, you determine what the author is saying, and you apply that today. There's all sorts of fallacies involved with that, making that hermeneutical application. Uh, but that's what we're trying to do is apply the Bible so that we can be um, not only God's people, that we can obey his word, that we can be holy, that we can be transformed, that our lives can become more and more glorifying to him, that we can be witnesses to the world, that we can be light and salt, on and on and on and on. So that's why we want to live according to the Bible. But so... To do that, when you're reading your, your Bible, you can rely upon the Holy Spirit, but someone might say something as crazy as, well, the Holy Spirit told me to tell you that you need to go and marry that girl over there, uh, or that you need to go buy that car, or that you need to sell your house, or you need to sell your stock, or you need to go tell that person that he's a meanie. Well, the Holy Spirit might not be telling you to do that. 
He told, I think he told me, but who's to say he told you? So that all based upon the, um, the whole basic premise of the scriptures. One of the basic uh, questions uh, of the catechism is, uh, here we go, what rule has God given us to direct us how we more, may glorify and enjoy him? The word of God, which is contained in the uh, Old and the New Testaments, is the only rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him. What do the scriptures principally teach? The scriptures principally teach what man is to believe and what his duty, what duty God requires of man, what we believe and what we do, how we live our lives, what we're to believe and how we live our lives. So if you can't even determine what the Bible is saying, then how, who knows what is up? Who knows what the truth is? Then it becomes subjective. But we know that that's not true. The truth is objective because Christ is the truth. Uh, he's the way, the truth, and the life. So it gets a little philosophical, but essentially we're trying to be faithful with our lives. And to do that, we study the Bible. We do listen to the Holy Spirit in its application because he does guide us in all truth. Yet at the same time, we have to be and use our minds uh, to understand the text as well. God is renewing our minds through the Holy Spirit and using the scriptures to do that. So the program um, called Exegesis is essentially these 12 steps that I have here. I learned this in seminary. These 12 steps to uh, are, are questions that we ask or the homework that we do to establish what is the author saying. Okay. So, first of all, you have to establish the text. Using the text that I have here, again, um, we take the Greek or the Hebrew, whatever it is. Uh, it might be your ESV Bible. It might be a New American Standard Bible. It might be uh, a new, uh, an ESV. So this is the ESV. Uh, this is a good, faithful, conservative uh, interpretation. You can go to esv.org online. Uh, this is an old 1977 or 63 actually, a Lockman Foundation um, New American Standard Bible reference edition. So it's got lots of uh, uh, notes, uh, references in the uh, on the sides here. I also have just a basic cheap, I think I paid a dollar or two from this, uh, New International Version. This is a 1984. Don't get a, anything beyond 1984. Uh, it's very important. See, it says it right there, 1984. Uh, after 1984, I think the next edition is 2011 or something like that. They, they are changed, and, and since then, there's even more changes. Committees are determining uh, frequently changes that need to be made rather than and they're moving away from the original language to a more uh, a culturally appropriate uh, language. So, for instance, here in 2023, uh, when there's so much uh, political emphasis on being culturally and politically correct, you shouldn't define someone as a man or a woman or, or a gender uh, because it's offensive or racist or whatever they want to call it. So now committees are, are changing pronouns and they're changing words uh, to reflect our culture. So we're moving away from the original Greek to an accurate translation to one that's more of a paraphrase and interpretation to please people. So you really have to be careful what Bible you use when you are trying to determine uh, what is being said. Okay, so the first thing you do is establish your text. So our text today uh, in, a, in another video is going to be verses 1 through 4. So that's what we're going to look at. The question that we're going to have is, should verse 4 be included with verses 1 and 3? And that's called establishing the text or its limits. Okay, the limits of your text of your text or pericope. All right, these are all key words. 
uh, that you might hear in the future. Then you make a translation. Next thing you do is you do some background work. What is the historical context? So um, let's see here. We're going to do a whole video just on the background in just a second. Uh, I'm going to talk about the author, the date, the audience, the setting, the purpose, outlines, um, variety of outlines, and commentaries um, that I'm using uh, way down here on point number 11. So what is the historical context? What's the background uh, to the book that you want to study? Uh, in this case, it's the book of Hebrews. So you need to understand uh, who the audience is. You need to understand their circumstances uh, you need to understand what the outline, what is the point of the author. And you can't even determine that without reading the whole book. So uh, and it's, before you even do all this, you should uh, read the whole book in one setting. And do that multiple times if you need to. Listen to it uh, on audio Bible. Uh, read the Bible. Listen to it so that you have a general sense of what is being said. You establish your text you translate it uh, from the original language. You look into the background um, of that text. And if you're uh, moving away, once you get the historical context, so say you're preaching through the book of Hebrews, you don't have to do a lot of the background work um, in chapter 2 that you did in chapter 1 because um, it's, it's not changing. Um, you're, it's the same audience listening or reading the letter or hearing the sermon. Uh, that you uh, that is being written. You determine the literary context. What type of uh, <coughs> letter is it? Um, it? What type of genre is, is it? Uh, is it historical narrative? Is it poetical? Is it a psalm? Uh, is it wisdom literature? Is it gospel? Is it a, a Pauline letter uh, of sorts? Is it a... Um, uh, so you see, it, it just goes on and on. Structure, the relationship of the actual uh, text itself. Some people, uh, like for instance, uh, William Lane. William Lane, let me see if I can find his book. Let's see here. I've got this book by William Lane. And this is one that preceded it. Uh, uh, William Lane. William Lane uh, says that this should be understood as a chiasm. What is a chiasm? A chiasm uh, looks like an arrow. And so what he does is, let's see if it's if it can be seen here. Oh, not there. He does it here. So you have A, B, C, C with apostrophe B with apostrophe A. So it looks like this. And then when you have the main point here and here, uh, everything in between is an inclusio. So it's chiastic. This is uh, this arrow, kind of like a greater than or a less than uh, arrow. So some people see structure like that. I tend to disagree. I think that um, it's clear that it's a comparison between long ago but in these last days, or the present days that we're in here, God, and then he gives us a description, a linear description of who Christ is uh, and what he's done <clears throat> with a consequence or a result. Having become superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So I don't necessarily agree that it's chiastic. And you'll see that when I uh, draw a relationship of the bracketing, okay? It, it, it shows that it shows it right there in this bracket, the way that it, by the way it looks. That's what structure is. Grammar, well, grammar uh, can play a really big role in understanding what is being said. You've got to understand relationships of uh, subjects, uh, predicates, uh, nouns, verbs. Uh, you've got to understand how in Greek or in Hebrew sometimes uh, there's not even a verb, the verb is implied. Sometimes, like in the, the book of uh, Hebrews here, he says that the uh, language of Hebrew, the author of Hebrew is very artistic and very prose oriented. He's very 
he's educated and it's very smooth and is done in such a way as to not only make relationships by hearing it, but it could be uh, as well by, um, let's see here. Uh, he says, a developed sense of rhythm, variations in meter, and cultivation of events of literary style that, uh, style that command attention of the ear when it is read aloud. So there's all sorts of factors that go into uh, grammar. And so you've got to understand the relationship of the accusative and the genitive and the dative, uh, the nominative. You've got to understand all that or at least be able to look in your Bible and understand um, how phrases relate to one another. Now see the English uh, sometimes to make it smooth in its translation, you lose some of the challenging interpretations of the Greek. So one of my challenges was right here in verse 4, uh, understanding these phrases uh, and their relationships to one another. Uh, just this text in particular is very much of a challenge uh, representing the whole book and it doesn't necessarily come that way uh, unless you take the NIV and the ESV and the NAS and you start comparing side by side what a particular verse says. So for instance in the Hebrews chapter 1 verse 4 it says, so he became as much superior to the angels. Here's the NAS. Having become as much better than the angels, he has inherited a more excellent name than they. And then the ESV will say, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So the NAS and the ESV are very close together. And the NIV uh, seems to be really far off. So which is... When you have different versions of the Bible, they're typically going to be pretty close to each other. But when verses are really divergent, you can tell that there's some grammatical relationships that make it hard to interpret in the English. And everybody across the board is having a challenge doing it. So it's really important to recognize that rather than just taking your... Um, your Bible for granted, um, it's good to have a comparisons uh, of texts. Okay, so that's the grammar. Lexical means that you go into your, um, your lexicon and you look up the meaning of words. Uh, words have ranges of meanings, uh, one, two, three, four, and possibly here you might find a reference that is what it means in the context of um, he sat down, uh, sitting down uh, from Psalm 110, verse 1, and in verse 3, and in verse 14 of uh, chapter 1 in Hebrews. Okay, and he sat down. So that was a, um, something that I delved into. So you need to understand uh, key terms and what they mean to determine what it means in the context of this letter. Sometimes... Uh, when you're doing your background homework, uh, that really might make a difference in the overall understanding of a particular text that you're studying. What is the biblical context? Well, for instance, here, this uh, is um, chapters 1, 1 through 4 um, is essentially the introduction to the book, and verses 5 through 14 are examples of verses 1 through 4. That you're in the in a future video I'm going to point out, though the support for this is all Old Testament texts. So the author of Hebrews goes through and he supports these points, um, uh, his uh, kingship or his creation or his ra the radiance of his glory, uh, his nature, his um, and the key words his. Um, purification for sins all there's verses to support this 
So that would be the biblical context. The Old Testament references being found in the New. And there's a whole way to interpret or to understand Old Testament verses when you find them for proof texts in the New Testament. Uh, sometimes they're just a summary. Sometimes they're bringing up a word. Paul uses them differently than Matthew. Matthew wants to talk about the kingship of Christ, and he uses all these points to point out who Jesus is. So, once again, what, where do you find the text that you're studying elsewhere in the Bible, and how is it referred to? You might be studying uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, and it talks about the latter days. Well, the latter days has to do with the last days from Daniel chapter 2, verse uh, 28. And in fact, the phrase is exactly the same uh, as it says here. Ep eskatu ton hemeron. All right, um, the day, the last days, so the esca, um, the days, the last. So, when you understand other references, sometimes that plays a role in interpreting a text. Okay, so you have lexical. What does the word mean? The ranges of meaning. Uh, how is the text understood in relationship to other texts? Speaking of the last days, then um, are there any key? theological concepts that are brought out in this and obviously there are because we we're talking about who is Jesus and wh who he is and what he's done and we had this great this fantastic list of Christ so I might um, bring out the uh, Westminster Confession of Faith uh, and talk about how um, in chapter 8 here we have a description of who Jesus Christ is and what he's done okay so that might be some of the theological um, topics that we might find in our text. We might find something that has to do with the last days. All right, so now you have uh, sonship, uh, or who is Christ. You have last days. You have um, the relationship to angels. That's a big topic because uh, he's making the point that Christ is greater than the angels, superior to the angels. So these are theological concepts. You know, the doctrine of angels, uh, much less the doctrine of demons. If you believe in, in angels, do you believe in demons? Um, so, once again, it gets really thick, but it helps you to understand all the information that goes into determining what is the author saying. And trust me, as you do these first 10 points, you're going to find that context, uh, the relationship to the previous text, and sometimes theology might read into it, because as you're trying to make your statement, your exegetical idea, you want to make sure that it's biblical, um, I would say reformed or consistently biblical, conservative, evangelical, biblical, reformed, um, and it's not whacked. Um, you know, it's not dispensational or it's not heretical um, in some way, shape, or form. So you need to check your theology. And this is where you come into secondary literature and commentaries. Inevitably, when ministers and pastors get really busy, they go to secondary literature first. They just pick out a text or they pick up the next paragraph or the next uh, parable or the next topic in their uh, in their text or on their sermon series, and they go and read what other people have to say about it. They have their favorite commentaries. But if you're doing your homework, your Bible study yourself, you're going to get more, you are going to come up with your own questions. And in fact, you're going to find out that the questions that you're asking, the secondary literature is not going to deal with. You're going to go to a commentary looking for an answer, and it's not going to be there. For example, I went to, uh, I think the guy's name was, uh, Leslie Allen for Psalm uh, 110, looking for information on sitting down. Uh, and he sat down, having um, pure, uh, made purification for sins, he sat down. So I wanted to 
you know, I, I, I know that's a loaded term. He sat down at the right hand. We know there's other examples of this uh, in the New Testament, whether it be in Galatians chapter 3 or Acts chapter 7. There's lots of examples of sitting down at the right hand. But in, re in relationship to kingship and his majesty uh, in Christ, what does it mean? And so I went there and, I, and nothing was said. Now, I did find in the commentaries... Um, uh, I, one of the the greatest collections of volumes on the book of Hebrew is by John Owens. John Owens actually had a little bit to say on sitting down, and he sat down at the right hand. Um, so he had something to say. I went and looked up some of my other favorite authors to see if they talked about uh, and Christ's kingship, uh, whether it be before the creation of the world's um, or after he accomplished his work, um, what does it say? And I found out uh, through some secondary literature distinguishing, actually it was in Meredith Klein, distinguishing between Christ's deity and the Son of Man, or the Son of God and the Son of Man in relationship to who he was. When he sat down at the right hand, it was not based upon uh, being the Son of God. Uh, his previous status um, as a deity as the in the Trinity, but it was as a result of being the Son of Man and accomplishing what he did for our benefit. And so as a having made purifications as a man, purely man in that hypostatic union, uh, speaking of that uh, exact representation of his the hypostasis is the word right there for nature, um, it, it makes a really significant point in clarifying when he sat down was he sitting down in in the position at the right hand of the father of that he had previously or now that he is earned by being faithful now that was really powerful to me but it was not in the secondary literature or in the commentaries and i got lots of commentaries but it didn't talk about that so sometimes the questions you ask are not going to be answered and i got that question by reading all this what is the purpose of him sitting down at the right hand? He talks about his glory and his honor uh, representatively uh, for our account as well as not only um, his position of majesty interceding on our behalf is uh, in the role of the high priest. So um, secondary literature comes at the end. Don't go to the commentaries first because everybody's got an opinion. You've got to understand that the people who write commentaries are printing their dissertations, or they work at a seminary, or something like that. They have to write books to maintain their PhD or their doctorate, whatever they're doing. And they're approaching the text from their perspective. They might be blooming liberals, Adolf Harnack or Weissman or whoever it is, Von Harnack or, uh, gosh, there's all sorts of crazy people out there. As I look up, I have some of their commentaries just so I can contrast uh, you know, conservative thought versus uh, the liberal um, uh, train of thought. You got to be careful that commentaries nowadays, many of them are written in a sermon format. They don't even provide the exegesis. So, for instance, Lane here, this outline for this book is just 11 chapters. Very, very very much of just a, a sermon series almost. Whereas in this book, he has two, two volumes of this, nine through 13 there. He's got two volumes, which is in more detail. So many people are just picking up these short little sermons and they're just cheating. They're totally lifting the author uh, or the commentator, uh, you know, because it's in a sermon series. Uh, let me get you a, an example of that. This is a reformed expository commentary. Okay, so this is on Malachi. Uh, and it's, it's conservative and it's good, but it's written almost in a sermon format and it does not grow into great detail it's more geared towards application it's more geared towards the hermeneutic the application so that 
someone who does not know Greek or Hebrew can pick up this uh, expository commentary and walk away from it with a conservative, evangelical, reformed perspective. You see what I'm saying? So there's a huge difference between this type of commentary and this type of commentary. D just leap years. And a lot of ministers like to go directly to this, to use this, because they don't know how to do the exegetical work to come up with the right questions to understand the exegetical idea, and then to determine what is the homiletical idea. So what is the question that you're asking? You've determined what the exegetical idea is, so now... In these last days, God speaks to us now through Christ because of who he is and what he has done. So if you want to write this into a homiletical idea, you would have to say uh, something like, uh, and just emphasizing, uh, God speaks to us through his word alone. Okay, Th through the Bible alone, or the Bible is our authority, or... Um, Jesus is the truth, the way, and the life, or whatever it is. And then you would use the text, um, talking about the Old Testament, how God used to speak to the people, and now how he speaks to us through the Son, and you define who Christ is and what he's accomplished, and, and stop there. That would be a homiletical idea. I'm not doing that in, in this in these videos. I'm not talking about that because that's too subjective. It's too... Um, personal, uh, depending upon who the minister is and the work that he's done. I'm just trying to define the exegetical idea so that if you're studying the book of Hebrews or another particular book, you can reference my text and hone in on a particular verse and go, oh, that's what that means in relationship to the context. This is the context. What does this description of Christ have to do with, or having made purification, that type of adverbial phrase, what does that have to do with uh, the description of the Son and what he has done? Okay. So, anyway, so at the very end, the whole point of exegesis is the application. But you first got to be able to determine what is the author saying in a phrase. And that's what I'm trying to do here in my videos. Thank you.